Well, it has been a very long time since we've been in the Psalms together, uh, but today we return to our series, God, My Exceeding Joy, and we're picking up our study today in Psalm 74. Psalm 74. Now, before we, uh, I read the psalm, I'll make a little connection with today. Of course, today is the 4th of July, our nation's birthday, and I suppose the song that will be sung the most not by most uh, everyday people, but at events is going to be the national anthem, uh, a, a song which looks back to a very specific event in our nation's history, uh, and that was the bombardment of Fort McHenry in Baltimore in the year 1814 by the British. Uh, it's, of all of our national anthems, it's one, uh, one of our patriotic songs. It's one of the few that specifically refers to a particular event like that. Well, I mention that because we're coming today into a psalm that is about a very specific event in Israel's history. But unlike our national anthem, this song we're going to study today is not about a day of triumph, but a day of great woe and distress. It, this is not a national anthem of Israel. It's more like a national dirge for what happened in the year 586. So that Study, the title of our study this morning is Psalm 74, How Long, O Lord, Waiting for God When the Bottom Has Dropped Out. All right, so let's read the psalm, and then we'll work our way through the outline. A Mosquil of Asaph. O God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to, the, to be the tribe of your inheritance, and this Mount Zion, where you have dwelt. Turn your footsteps toward the perpetual ruins. The enemy has ravaged everything within the sanctuary. Your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They've set up their own standards for signs. It seems as if one had lifted up his axe in a forest of trees, and now all its carved work they smash with hatchet and hammers. They have burned your sanctuary to the ground. They have defiled the dwelling place of your name. They said in their heart, let us completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long? How long, O God, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn your name forever? Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand, from within your bosom, destroy them? Yet God is my king from of old, he who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. You gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. You broke open springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day. Yours also is the night. You have prepared the light and the sun. You have established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. Remember this, O Lord, that the enemy has reviled and a foolish people has spurned your name. Do not deliver the soul of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. Consider the covenant, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Let not the oppressed return dishonored. Let the afflicted and needy praise your name. Arise, O God, and plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you all day long. Do not forget the voice of your adversaries, the uproar of those who rise against you, which ascends continually. God add blessing to the reading of his word. Well, come with me now to your handout, and on that front page, we'll talk about first what kind of psalm this is, the genre of this psalm. This psalm is a communal lament. If 
you didn't get that <laughs> or didn't remember the word, there's no doubt about it. This is a lament, a mournful song. It's a sad song for the whole congregation, or I should say what's left of the congregation after the destruction of the temple. The psalm speaks of God's people as a whole and often uses we and us and indicating that this is a corporate song. There is one reference to me or my in verse 12 where he says, yet God is my king, but in this spot the psalmist is acting like a representative for everyone else. There are some parts of laments, found in other laments that aren't in this one, and there are some extra things in this that aren't usually found in laments, like the, the creation hymn in the middle of it, but it's clearly a lament with very profound power. As far as the setting, the historical setting and the way this psalm was used, we were told that the author is Asaph. Um, I, I would say that this is a descendant of Asaph, a, an Asaphite, uh, Psalms 73 to 83 all have the same kind of heading to them. Asaph, you might remember, was the chief musician in the days of David, his brother Haman, who wrote Psalm 88, and then another musician named Ethan, Ethan. These were the chief worship leaders amongst the Levites that David had appointed. And Asaph's descendants were active in leading worship for centuries. Even when the Jews come back from the Babylonian exile, um, 450 years after David, the Asaphites are there leading worship again. Um, Psalm 74 was not written in the days of David. This is written during the time of the Babylonian overthrow. And um, does anyone remember? Now, this is one of the most important dates in Old Testament history. What year did Nebuchadnezzar destroy the temple? It starts with a five. Close. It does follow with an eight. 586, 586 B.C. This is one of the most pivotal points in Israel's history. It's one of the darkest points in their history. This is 400 years after David's time. Um, this was most likely, so it's not written by Asaph in David's day, because it's not a prophetic song, probably written by one of his descendants. It's possible that Psalm 73 is also written by a descendant of Asaph. It's, it's even possible that this descendant you know, four centuries later, also had the name Asaph. You know, that's, you can't prove it, but it's possible. Uh, the background to it, of course, is the Babylonian destruction of the temple, 586. This was the most seismic disappointment that Israel had faced since they had been in Egypt. It was like a complete reversal of everything that God had done at Mount Sinai. The heart of the covenant that was made with Moses at Mount Sinai was that God would dwell with his people, in their, be in their midst, he would bless them so long as they kept the covenant. I, I want us to turn back to a couple verses in uh, Exodus, and please keep your spot here in Psalm 74, but turn back to Exodus 25. I, I've listed two spots, but really there, it's all over the Torah where this uh, kind of statement is made. Exodus 25, verse 8, this is after the Ten Commandments have been given, and God who is present there at Mount Sinai is now telling them he's going to be present with them wherever they go in a special way. And he says in verse 8, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. So God is about to do something with Israel that he has not done with humankind since the days of Adam and Eve to physically dwell in their presence. Uh, so this is exceedingly special. Look at Exodus 29, verses 45 to 46. Exodus 29, verses 45 to 46. Uh, we'll back up to verse 44. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. I will dwell among the sons of Israel and I will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. So the special thing about the tabernacle and the temple is that God is living there in an extremely unique way. Now, now in one sense, God is everywhere. He's omnipresent and always has been and always will be. But nonetheless, he can make his presence known in special ways. And for Israel, it was in the sanctuary. So this psalm is 
lamenting the fact that God has left the sanctuary and allowed it to be destroyed. God allowing the temple to be ruined indicated that God had abandoned his house. He had abandoned his house and by implication then he had left them in judgment. Because the terms of the covenant was, you will be my people, I will be your God, I will dwell in the midst of you so long as you keep the covenant. And what's happened is, they've broken the covenant. Uh, I want us to turn to one other passage. This isn't in your notes, but Deuteronomy chapter 31. Deuteronomy 31. This is in the last weeks of Moses' life. And the Lord is helping him prepare the nation for Moses to be gone and Joshua to take his place. Deuteronomy 31, uh, let's see, verse 16. The Lord said to Moses, Behold, you are about to lie down with your fathers, and this people will arise and play the harlot with the strange gods of the land into the midst of which they are going, and will forsake me and break my covenant which I have made with them. Then my anger will be kindled against them in that day, and I will forsake them and hide my face from them, and they will be consumed, and many evils and troubles will come upon them, so that they will say in that day, Is it not because our God is not among us that these evils have come upon us? But I will surely hide my face in that day because of all the evil which they will do, for they will turn to other gods." Well, that is what led to the destruction of the temple. They had for centuries proven themselves to be covenant breakers. And so God called in the terms of the Mosaic Covenant. He left his house and left his people for the moment. That's the background of this painful song we just sang. There are, now let me say right away, there are some things that are different about us as God's people, New Covenant people, and Israel in this experience. And that is that God has promised us in the gospel that he will never leave us or forsake us because we are under a new arrangement with the Lord. We are not bound to the Lord by the covenant at Mount Sinai. We are bound to the Lord through the covenant made through Jesus Christ. Nonetheless, we learn some things from this painful song and this period in Israel's life. Come back to your handout and look at letter C there. We'll think about the way that this psalm was used in ancient days. Let's think about if, if you're an Israelite, uh, the temple's been destroyed. Uh, at this point, two-thirds of the Jews have either been killed or dragged away into exile. There's a remnant of people there. What do you do? You can't go to temple. There's no temple to go to. How are you supposed to praise God? How are you supposed to worship God? So it, it may be that you know, there was a minimal amount of worship still happening on the grounds of the temple, kind of like today in Jerusalem at the Wailing Wall. I mean, that's, that's not even part of the temple itself. It's just as part of the retaining wall that the temple sat up on. And there today, Jews go to pray, and there are a couple uh, synagogues right there on, on that spot. Well, in these ancient days, it might have been songs like this were used as songs of worship. And also, there's an entire book that was written right at this same time. Remember that little book with five chapters? It's the book of, well, it starts off with this, Lamentations. The book of Lamentations, written by the prophet Jeremiah, comes right out of this same period. And one of the purposes of that book might have been to give the Jews something to pray and say when everything had fallen all around them. And then the years that followed and the generations that followed, this sad song would be sort of a prayer guide for the Jews who were still in the Babylonian exile. Very briefly, I want to say a few things about why Psalm 74 is where it is in the, in the Psalms. You remember that these, the Psalms are not written in the order, they're not put in the order in which they were written, they've been compiled this way. Uh, Psalm 74 is part of the third part of the Psalms, Psalm 73 to 89. This is a collection of songs mostly written by Asaph and other musicians, only one of them is by David. Uh, these Psalms prefer to use the 
the title God as opposed to Lord in them. So you'll find more references using the particular word God as opposed to Lord. Um, there are some things that Psalm 74 shares in common with Psalm 73. You know, they, they both deal with the sanctuary. You know, in Psalm 73, the psalmist is puzzled why it is that ungodly people are, are prospering. And he says, well, then I went to the sanctuary and then I understood that God has put their feet in slippery places. Psalm 74 is about the sanctuary, but there's no more sanctuary to go to. It's been destroyed. Um, there's a rare word, the Hebrew word, the word ruin is only found in Psalm 73 and Psalm 74. Um, both of these psalms talk about the wicked, like Psalm 73 says the wicked are not going to succeed. Psalm 74 prays that the wicked will be put down and not succeed. And I guess you could say Psalm 74, 5, and 6, they, they all have the themes of God's wrath, God's salvation, and God's special name. So that seems to be some reasons that these songs, even though they may have been written at different periods, were put together where they are. Now, talking about the outline, the structure of Psalm 74, this psalm we read has three parts to it. It starts off with a complaint of desertion. God, you left us. Why did you leave us? How long are you going to be gone? Verses 1 to 11. Followed by a hymn of confidence. In verses 12 through 17, God is my king, and he destroyed this and destroyed that. He's in control of this and in control of that. And then it ends with a prayers for vindication, for God to vindicate his name, verses 18 to 23. That opening portion in verses 1 to 11 pleads for God's mercy after he has allowed the destruction of the temple. Uh, and the, the destruction is recounted in very graphic detail. Verses 1 to 11 begins with questions for God, like verse 1, again, uh, that opens up with the question, oh God, why have you rejected us? Why does your anger burn? Verses 10 and 11 ask more questions. How long uh, oh Lord, why do you withdraw your hand? So that sort of brackets the opening portion. The middle portion, verses 12 to 17, stands out as a hymn of confidence which celebrates how God is the king of creation. And you know, if you, if you know your Old Testament history, when Nebuchadnezzar took out the temple, in that same period he also took out other things. He also took out Israel's king. There was no more royal house in Israel. They lost their king, they lost their sanctuary, and they lost their land. And yet the psalmist still knows God is the ultimate king, and he celebrates him here. He's described as having mastery over these mythic powers of evil, which we'll talk about in a little bit, and how he's in complete control of creation, even though everything seems to be out of control. And I, and I suppose for the psalmist that makes this overthrow of God's house all the more shocking. Lord, you're sovereign over everything. Look at your house. And the final portion, again, is loaded with pleas for God to defend his honor and restore dignity to his people for his namesake. And uh, there's two parts to that. Each of them begins with, O God, or O Lord, appealing to him directly. There, there's also another interesting thing, and that is the, uh, the verbs in the Hebrew text uh, shift between each of these sections without going into a lot of detail, verses, uh, you've got uh, in verse 1 and 4, 5, 6, 7, and 8, and then 12 through 17, you've got past tense verbs. But then in between that, you have requests. Uh, do this, help us with this. So there's this switching back and forth between this has happened, oh Lord, do this for us. God, this has happened, do this for us. And, and that also marks out the, the subsections in the poem. Some notes, uh, ob other observations before we walk through the visual outline. There are some repeated words uh, through it. Particularly, there's repeated questions. We already noted how verse 1 is loaded with questions, and so is verses 10 and 11. Uh, questions about suffering. Why, God? Why have you done it? Now, the, the Bible has an answer for why it had come, why this had happened, but they're speaking out of the emotion of the moment and trying to understand why it would be so bad as it is. There's also words for continuousness that are used. Verses uh, 2, 3, 10, 12, 19, 23. There's things that are said to be forever. Like, look at verse 
um, verse 2, remember your congregation, which you've purchased of old, which you've redeemed. So there's the, the phrase from of old in verse 1, oh God, why have you rejected us forever? So this foreverness and continualness is the, the suffering, the trouble they're going through just seems to be unending. And it's highlighted by those word choices used throughout it. This is a song that also talks about redemptive history. Um, it's focused on one moment, that awful moment in 586 B.C., but it also repeats how God, like in verse 2, had God brought Israel out of Egypt into the land and made his home on the holy hill of Zion. If you look back at verse 2, remember your congregation which you purchased of old, that is, you redeemed us out of Egypt, you re which you re have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance, the inheritance is the land of Israel, and this Mount Zion. So there you have a, a history of like 400 years covered in one verse. We were in Egypt, you redeemed us and brought us out, you brought us into this land, and then we set up the, your, your house of worship on Mount Zion, but now you've deserted it. You've let it go. Flip over the page. Verse 20 asks God, another part of redemptive history, to remember the covenant. And this is a uh, kind of an important interpretive question in, in Psalm 74. God had made a covenant with his people, but you have to figure out now what covenant are we talking about? Because let's, let's see, what are the main the things that are called covenants in the Bible? Well, the first one that's called a covenant is the covenant made with Noah, that he's not going to flood the, and destroy the world in that, that way again. There's going to be regularity to the world. He made a covenant with Abraham about his descendants. He made a covenant with Moses, at Mount, or, well, through Moses at Mount Sinai. He made a covenant with David, and there's others as well. So which one is it? Remember the covenant, the verse says. I, I, don't, think, I don't think they want him to remember the Mosaic covenant, <laughs> because what they just went through was because they broke the Mosaic covenant. They had broken the law, they pursued other gods, you can read it in in the books of Kings and Chronicles. And God said, you don't want to be in covenant with me, and he leaves them. So I think the reference to the covenant is probably something like the covenant made with Abraham. Because the covenant made with Abraham didn't have any conditions. The, the covenant with Abraham was a promise that he would make Abraham's name great, he would make his descendants great, and through him blessing would come to the whole world. So I think this is referring back to that. It, it's possible it refers to the covenant made with David, which also extended on into the ages as well. Nonetheless, even, even though they have broken the covenant of Moses, God is still bound to them by other covenants. And uh, that is invoked as they ask God to show mercy, even though they're not deserving of it. There's a reference to bad signs in this psalm as well. Verse 4 says that the enemy had erected signs in the temple, in the temple courtyard. And the signs they've uh, uh, erected, I'm going to make some room on the board here. Um, the uh, signs that are spoken about, like let's take a look at the verse again, uh, verse 4 your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. They have set up their own standards for signs. This is probably military ensigns. These are like the banners that the soldiers carry in front with a, uh, a banner up top. And, they, and in ancient days, these would often have images of pagan gods on them. So here you are in the courtyard of the Lord, and there's these images of foreign gods there. Well, that's, what is that doing there? So that's a bad sign. Things are not going well. Now, imagine today if you walked into our chapel, which is, is not a sanctuary in the sense that the temple was of old, but imagine you walked in there and you found you know, a flag for Islam and a flag for Zoroastrianism and something else like that. You'd think, well, what in the world is going on here? That's not what ought to be there. Now, look, up. there's another reference to signs in verse 9. Verse 9, we do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, nor is there any among us who knows how long. The signs spoken of here are probably like miraculous signs. And notice how it's connected with the prophets, that the prophets could signify, would tell them what was going on, 
and you know whether there was a resolution to this but in this case the prophets there's there's no word from god about when this is going to be over it's there's no seemingly no hope for them at this point now there were prophets in the land still a few there was jeremiah who wrote the lamentations and his associate baruch but you know jeremiah was basically imprisoned most of the time he, he wasn't having much of an audience at that point if the psalmist could have sat down with Jeremiah, he would have understood everything that was going on and how long it would be. But remember also, Jeremiah ended up getting dragged away by some of the Jews into Egypt where he spent most of the rest of his life. Most of the other prophets are gone. Another uh, note about the psalm is it talks about God seeming in action. It seems like God's not doing anything. The, the psalm repeatedly urges God to do something and the psalmist can't understand why he hasn't acted. V verse 11 even implies that it's like God has his hand inside his robe. You know, why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand, in some versions, even your right hand fr from within your bosom? You know, that, like he's got his shirt inside his jacket, or his hand inside his jacket, and says, now, now pull your hand out and do something. Destroy them. We can't do anything. You, you have to do it. Uh, one last uh, introductory comment about it is verses 12 to 7 describe God's cosmic victory. There are a few verses here that are really unusual, and I direct your attention again to verses 13 to 14. You divided the sea by your strength. You broke the heads of the sea monsters in the waters. You crushed the heads, heads, plural, of Leviathan, you gave him as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Uh, that's some pretty graphic talk, isn't it? Um, in these two verses, God's power is described in epic terms. He's described as the defeater of dragons, the monsters of chaos. To us, this sounds kind of unusual, but if you lived in the days of, of this time, this language was very familiar because all of the nations around Israel had mythology about sea monsters and you know when the when the seas stormed and winter came and winter storms came the myth was that the sea god was wreaking havoc and trying to take over the land and then so they would pray to one of the Baals to go and fight against the sea monster and he would temporarily defeat him and that would bring in spring and summer and every year there's this back and forth between this and there's there's actually you can see a picture down at the bottom that is a pendant a clay pendant uh, a Canaanite pendant of a Canaanite bowing before a seven-headed monster um, and in, in uh, Canaanite literature this monster was called Litan and it seems like the Hebrew equivalent closest thing to that is Leviathan um, now I don't think the psalmist believes that there is a seven-headed dragon or, or monsters in this, who rule the sea, but he's using the language of the cultures round about them. And, and the storyline here is nothing like the stories in ancient mythology. God, the thought is that God is over. You know, imagine the worst cosmic power you can think of. God's greater than that. In pagan mythology, these stories of Baal battling the sea god, this was sort of their weird creation stories. And notice that right after this, he talks about how God is in control of creation. If you look at verses uh, uh, 15 and 16, you broke open springs and torrents. You dried up ever-flowing streams. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You've prepared the light and the sun. You've established all the boundaries of the earth. You have made summer and winter. You're in compl complete control of creation. And it might even allude to what God did in real history, like when he broke open the floodwaters in the days of Noah or when he stopped up the Red Sea and the Jordan River in the days of the Exodus. That shows God's mastery over creation. These made up gods, sea monsters, though they look awful in the pictures, they're nothing. So the psalmist has confidence. God is the king over everything. There's no evil you can imagine that can outdo him. And that, that's good, that's good thinking. God is sovereign over everything. The hard part then is, why does the sovereign, why has the sovereign allowed this trouble that we're in? 
the answer is not that he's lost control. He has his own purposes, but the psalmist in the moment can't pierce through to it. Isn't that like us? We, we, we go through troubles, not as severe as what Israel went through here. We go through troubles, we know on one hand, God is the sovereign over all things. On the other hand, we see things that are happening to us and think, why is God allowing this? Uh, and we can't always pierce through to the why or to the how long. But whatever we go through here, we know that what is said about God being the victor is still true. And you know what? God was not done with Israel. God had a plan and a purpose, and he was faithful to his covenant that made through Abraham. He brought them through it. There was hardship and trouble, but God brought them through, and, and we are the beneficiaries of that. It's because Israel continued to survive that we have a Savior who was born centuries later. All right, well, um, I've got a little bit of time left. I'm going to see if we can walk our way now through the visual outline chart that you've got there on the back side. Um, and what this does, if you've not seen one of these before, the, the layers at the top show you the major segments of the, of the psalm, and then the columns below drill down for a detailed description of that. So up at the top of that, there's a purpose statement that says that this psalm is written, it's reflecting on the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The psalm urges God to action against those who desecrated the sanctuary of the cosmic king of creation. Written as a communal lament sometime after the fall of Jerusalem in 586 by a descendant of Asaph. There are a couple headings to the psalm. Uh, a maskil of Asaph, the, a maskil, that's a Hebrew word that it, it could mean it's instruction. I don't think that fits so well in this psalm. It seems to be, uh, it's a word meaning something like wisdom. So, but wisdom could be wisdom that's given or wisdom that's needed, like to play skillfully. So uh, this is a mournful song that needs, you would assign your better musicians to the performance of a psalm like this. And the author is Asaph, or as I explained before, likely one of his descendants. All right, the first major column there, the opening complaint, is about the destruction of God's sanctuary by evil invaders in verses 1 to 11. And this itself breaks up into three parts. There's an initial plea in verses 1 to 3 with these interrogative appeal to God's mercy. Interrogative that's asking a question, Oh God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smoke against the sheep of your pasture? And implied in that is God show mercy to us. We don't know what you're doing or why you're doing it. We beg you to show mercy. We're your people and yet you're, you're, you've treated us like we're not your flock. And, of course, as you read the prophets, it's because they had acted like they were not his flock. But uh, here is the prayer coming out of the pain of the moment. Verse 2, there's a plea to remember his redeemed ones. Remember your congregation, which you have purchased of old, which you have redeemed to be the tribe of your inheritance, and this Mount Zion where you have dwelt, referring to how it, God had brought them out of Egypt brought them into the land, and then he had put his presence there at Mount Zion in the temple because he had redeemed them. Don't forget all that you've done for us in the past, he says. Verse 3, there's a plea for God's attention to the desecration of his house. Turn your footsteps toward the perpetual ruins. The enemy has damaged everything within the sanctuary. So he's looking at what happened to Jerusalem, and, I mean, it's just, a, it's just a heap. You know, there's, there's some damage that happens to your house, a hailstorm or a tree falls, and you think, well, that's a, that's a problem, but that, that's a mess. Uh, but, but we can fix it. We can fix it. But, but look at something like this hotel collapse that happened in Florida. There is no fixing that. That's a perpetual ruin. That's, that's all it will ever be. So he said, Lord, look at what they've done. It's totally destroyed. In verses 4 to 9, there's a past tense description of this desecration. As he details what's happening, there's a recounting of the sacrilege in verses 4 to 8, beginning with the sights and sounds of the pagan invaders. Your enemies have roared in the midst of your meeting place. Well, you know, people aren't supposed to go into the temple and shout and, you know, clamor and make triumphant sounds like they're running the place. They've set up their own standards for signs, these military ensigns with pictures of Marduk and the Baals and things that ought not be there. 
The ornate interiors have been destroyed, in verses 5 to 6, as if one had lifted up his axe in a forest of trees, and now all its carved work they smash with hatchet and hammers. Who let these lumberjacks into the temple to destroy everything? What a sight. The structure in verse 7 has been burned and defiled. They burned your sanctuary to the ground. They defiled the dwelling place of your name. Uh, last Sunday night we were talking about the difference between uh, desecration and defilement. Defilement is where you have a clean thing and it becomes unclean. Well, the, the temple was not just a clean thing. It was a holy thing. It's not only been desecrated, it's been defiled, dragged down to the lowest level of all, treated as dirt. And all of this was part of a campaign of total suppression. Verse 8 says, They said in their heart, Let us completely subdue them. They have burned all the meeting places of God in the land. And that may be a reference to there were memorial altars in different places, like at Bethel and at Shiloh. There were places where God had done things in Israel's past where people may have gathered for prayer. And all of those are gone too. And this leads to, verse 9, the bewilderment of the remnant. There's no prophetic encouragement anymore. We do not see our signs. There's no longer any prophet. And, there, and there's no end in sight. Uh, th nor is there any among us who knows how long. Uh, how long is it going to be like this? We, we can't do anything about it. We have to wait on God. And then verses 10 and 11, there's a repeated plea. This slide has opened with a plea. Now in the middle of the psalm, here's another plea, another interrogative appeal, asking God a question. This about his honor. How long, O God, will the adversary revile and the enemy spurn your name forever? Hey, we're, it's not just that we're suffering, but your name has been dragged into the mud, God. Are you, will you do nothing? There's an interrogative appeal to God's power in verse 11. Why do you withdraw your hand, even your right hand? And then followed by an urgent appeal for action. From within your bosom, pull your right hand out and destroy them. This is the opening complaint. It is sharp and painful. And in the moment, they just can't see why it is all this has happened. Now, again, as you read the prophets, particularly Jeremiah and Ezekiel, it's, it's clear why this happened. But, you know, they were still a remnant of faithful people, and they suffered through this. Jeremiah was a faithful prophet, and he suffered through this period. And it leads to questions of how long before God does something. Now, the hymn of confidence in verses 12 to 17 is a celebration of the Creator's power over cosmic forces. It starts off with a confession and confidence in the heavenly king in verse 12. Yet God is my king from of old, he who works deeds of deliverance in the midst of the earth. He thinks back to what God had done in the earlier centuries of the Old Testament, and he knows God is all-powerful. There, there's no one like him. Uh, and then he describes in verses 13 to 14 God's victory over chaotic powers, his mastery over the chaotic sea. You divided the sea by your strength. Now, that could be a reference to what happened at the Red Sea. It, it could even refer to back at creation. You know, when the, the world is first made, God separated the, the land from the sea. Uh, and, and, and in the pagan world, the thought was the sea was this uncontrollable thing that, you know, you just had to sort of pray that it didn't swallow everything up. And, and, but Genesis 1, verse 2, the second verse of the Bible, you know, that darkness was on the face of the deep, it sounds kind of chaotic, but the very next thing is, and the Spirit of God hovered over the surface of the waters. What other peoples would think was chaotic was completely under God's control, and he set it up just the way he wanted it to be. Verse 14 describes in mythic terms the way God crushed the evil monster. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. Now, there were great sea creatures uh, Leviathan is a, a kind of creature mentioned in Genesis 1, a great sea creature, but I think this is a sort of a, a mythic creature. It has multiple heads, sort of like the picture you see on your handout. Um, in the pagan world, there were great gods like this who ruled the sea, and then God just squashes all of them. You got one head, I kill that one, and I kill that one, and I kill that one, and I kill that one. 
And, and then he slaughters this beast and gives it to the creatures of the wilderness to eat. Hmm. By the way, that is not a video of any event. You'll, you will not, you go through the rest of the Old Testament, there is no single event to which that refers. This is not a video of events. It's a vision of God's victory using the language of the peoples round about them. Verses 15 to 16 is using more real-to-life uh, descriptions of things, his mastery over the creation. You broke open springs and torrents. It could refer to, again to the flood of Noah. You dried up ever-flowing streams. I mean, you think of ever-flowing streams as opposed to wadis. You know, here in Southern California, we've got these uh, dry riverbeds that they flood now and then. But then there's rivers that are just always flowing. Uh, now, it'd be one thing if, if I went out to a dry riverbed and I said, water, stop. And, yeah, and I'd say, see, I did it. <laughs> and you say, yeah, it, it always does that. <laughs> it's another thing if I go out to a raging river and tell it to stop and it actually stops. That's God's power. God can do that. He did it to the Jordan, for instance. Um, verse 16, yours is the day. Yours also is the night. So he's not just the God of the daytime. He's also in control of nighttime, too. You've prepared the light and the sun, referring back to his creative work in Genesis 1. You've established all the boundaries of the earth. You've made summer and winter. You're in complete control of the world. You're in complete control of the weather. You know, the pagans had storm gods and lightning, Baal. There's actually drawings that people had of Baal, Baal, and he's holding a lightning bolt in his hand. The Lord is the one who's sovereign all over all these things. So here's a hymn of confidence in the midst of all of this. And it's good to focus on how great God is because it, it helps us to deal with when things are going so badly. And that, that brings us back now to the final portion, verses 18 to 23. There's the climactic petition, this petition for God's vindication and deliverance. And it has two halves. Each of them begin with an appeal to God, like verse uh, uh, 18. Remember this, O Lord. And look at verse 22. Arise, O God. So there's two appeals made. The first appeal is a request for the reversal of this dishonor that God has experienced. It's an appeal to Yahweh's honor that's been reviled by the foolish invaders. Remember this, O Lord, that the enemy has reviled and a foolish people has spurned your name. It's talking about the Babylonian invaders. It makes pleas for God to help his people in verses 19 to 21 because the people are defenseless. Do not let the soul, verse 19, do not let the soul of your turtle dove do not deliver the soul of your turtle dove to the wild beast. Do not forget the life of your afflicted forever. The turtle dove, I mean, this is a little tiny bird. Little tiny bird versus great big beast. How's that going to go? Not going to go well. Israel is like the little tiny bird. Lord, don't, don't, let us be, don't let us be devoured by this beast. We are your afflicted, we are your afflicted ones. And the Hebrew is there, plural, your afflicted ones. Verse 20, consider the covenant, verse we looked at before, uh, for, for the dark places of the land are full of the habitations of violence. Everywhere we go, there's bloodshed and death and destruction. Lord, remember the covenant you made, and I think this is the covenant that had been made with Abraham. Verse 21, there's the prospect that if God acts, if God delivers them, that there will be opportunity for his people to publicly praise him again. Let not the oppressed return dishonored. Let the afflicted and needy praise your name. Give us a reason, Lord, to come back to give thanks for how you delivered us from Babylon, how you rebuilt this place and brought us back to this land, not as slaves, but as free people again. And I think implied in that is a promise, Lord, when you deliver us, we will give you thanks. In the last couple of verses, the second round of requests for this reversal of dishonor is an appeal to God's honor reviled by foolish invaders. Again, it's very much like verse 18, verse 22. Arise, O God, and plead your own cause. Remember how the foolish man reproaches you all day long. Again, referring to the Babylonians and their taunting uh, after their destruction of Jerusalem. And lastly, in verse 23, there's a plea for God's enemies to be silenced. Do not forget the voice of your adversaries, the uproar of those who rise against you, which ascends continually. It's like in, uh, back in, let's see, what was the verse, uh, in verse um, uh, 
four, your enemies, your adversaries have roared in the midst of your meeting place. Now, in the world of sports, you can imagine if you have, uh, sometimes there's a joke, you know, if you've got a bunch of uh, Angels fans and a Dodgers fan comes in the middle and starts shouting, you know, then they, he kind of gets, <laughs> he's dealt with <laughs> sometimes in not so nice a way. And that's obviously a more playful sort of thing, but imagine, imagine Angel Stadium being completely overrun by all Dodgers and Angels people not being allowed to come back anymore. I mean, what, what why? Why would such a thing take place? Even in a worse way now, here's the temple of God overrun by Babylonians. They're speaking this strange language, praying to their god Marduk and their different, the different gods who they claim brought them victory. Lord, don't let this go on. Your honor is at stake. So this is a psalm that ends without a resolution. You know, the national anthem that gets sung today starts off kind of as a lament. You know, oh man, you think about there's bombs bursting in the air and, and it, we were worried about what was going to happen, but then in the morning we saw that the flag was still there. Now this song, uh, they don't know if the flag is still there. <laughs> it's a mournful situation. Now the good news is though, even that's the end of the psalm, it's not the end of the story. God wasn't done with his people. He did have a reason. He did have a time. And they needed to wait on him. And they needed to remember the middle of the song and live by that, that he was still the sovereign one and had not lost control. Well, Father, we thank you for the time we've had this morning to look into this uh, painful song. And, and yet it encourages us that when we go through times of trouble and questioning why you allow things and how long it will be, that you are still the sovereign one and you do have a plan and a purpose that you'll accomplish it for Jesus' sake. And we, pr we thank you that we are not under the same covenant that uh, the psalmist was in the covenant of Moses in which there were threats of curses, but we are under the new covenant with Jesus Christ who has promised to never leave us or forsake us and to use all of our troubles and our trials for our good, to purify our faith, and to draw us closer to you. So with thankful hearts, we lift up this prayer, and we ask for your guidance as we face our troubles. In Jesus' name.